Well, welcome back everybody to the University of Idaho and University of Wyoming Extension Sheep and Goat webinar series. Um, I'm one of your hosts, Melinda Ellison, University of Idaho Extension Sheep Specialist. Carmen Wilmore is also a host for this webinar series. She's an extension educator in Idaho in Lincoln County. And today your speaker is Whit Stewart, who is also one of the hosts on this webinar series. And he is the University of Wyoming Sheep Extension Specialist. Um, as always, make sure you're following along on our Facebook pages, UI Sheep and Goats and UW Sheep for any updates and things that we have coming at you for information on the sheep and goat side of things. Also, each week we have these live webinars and then we post the webinars to our YouTube channel and that is the University of Idaho Extension Livestock YouTube channel. And today, Witt's gonna be sharing some uh, research that he's worked on um, on parasite management for Intermountain West sheep flocks. And this is gonna be in preparation for next week's um, parasite and FAMACHA training. So um, make sure that you join us for that next week and Wit, take it away. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Melinda. And, and thank you everyone for being on this afternoon. Um, as Melinda mentioned, this is gonna be a, a largely a primer for um, our FAMACHA training next week, Thursday. Um, and so I will allude to that quite a bit. The purpose of today's uh, webinar really is just to kind of talk a little bit about some of the nuance of internal parasite management relative to the main problem, which is the barber pole worm or, or Hermonchus contortus in our region um, for irrigated flocks. Again, this uh, is not to be exhaustive. There's a lot of internal parasites um, of various species and varieties that, that require a talking of themselves. But the purpose of the day is to talk about, again, the Hamonchus contortus, a little bit about its biology, the life cycle, some of the literature related to how resistant uh, these organisms are to our anthelmintics, and especially in our region. And so I'll give you a little bit of uh, a summary from our, our kind of field study where we've sampled from flocks in the Intermountain West to, to estimate resistance. Um, and then finally, just some, some uh, specifics for our region and why our region is so unique compared to some of the regions that are really pushing forward our internal parasite research in the country. And a shameless plug again for next week's training. We hope you'll join us. You know, this will be a bit of an experiment. Uh, I have yet to participate in a online FAMANCHA training, but uh, our colleague Dave Scott at ATRA um, will do a great job of, of kind of helping walk us through that. And it'll be a, a longer training. And so a lot of the details that I may perhaps uh, overlook today, we will cover in, in greater depth next week. Also, I really need to put in a plug for the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. This is a really apt group of, of uh, practitioners, scientists, parasitologists uh, that work to kind of stay on the forefront of um, internal parasite management. Um, that group is expanding in terms of its members in our country. I, I uh, participate to a limited extent with, with this group, but just so many resources on that website uh, for internal parasite issues, um, and lots of good, excellent scientists and educators have contributed to that. So please check that out. I always show this graph that kind of shows the breakdown of, of sheep operations in our region, but today is really gonna have a small farm flock or uh, irrigated flock type focus. If you look across the states and even across our country, the majority of all sheep operations are in that one to 100 head range. And, and that's helpful for us, I think, in the research and, and the academic side, because uh, with that, we understand that there is a tremendous amount of producers that are in that small flock category whose challenges are, are very diverse and different than those of our, our large range operations. And so the, the large extent of what I'll talk about today has direct application to those smaller flocks, but specifically those smaller flocks that are operating on irrigated or sub-irrigated pasture systems, because those represent the greatest risk for internal parasite issues uh, in, in the Intermountain West. I also will, will be a broken record talking about how important it is to distinguish some of the regional nuances with uh, the environment that is suitable for internal parasites. Um, this map right here, and I'll, I'll 
talk about this as a tool for your individual operations, but this is the Climate Explorer, and it basically mines historic data, uh, gives us an idea of what um, our temperatures look like, our precip look like at various points of the year. This screenshot that I took basically shows the minimum average daily temperature in the summertime uh, across the US. Obviously, the, the red and orange portions experience greater uh, minimum daily temperatures than, than us in the Intermountain West that's delineated on that scale in, in a blue or darker blue. But I think this is really important as we talk about um, how important it is to generate regional data for our, our producers. Um, and you're, you're a participant in that. Uh, the data that I'll show today only happened because we were able to work with producers in our region in the Intermountain West. And so what we experience is going to be very different even than what is experienced in terms of uh, the onset of internal parasite challenges in the Northern Plains, and especially the contrast to the Southeastern US where a lot of the great research on internal parasite management and small ruminants has, has came from recently. Today, as I mentioned previously, we're gonna strictly talk about uh, the Hamonchus catortis species, a little bit of reference to other uh, Trichostrongylid uh, species as well, but the barber pole worm or the Hamonchus, um, those are uh, a significant challenge in irrigated pasture systems in the summer months. And so I just wanna show you this figure to point out that um, as I talk about resistance and products that uh, certain organisms are resistant to, I'm strictly talking about our estimates of resistance to our dewormers in the Hamonchus uh, contortus species. Um, I by no means am advocating that, that these products don't work for these other um, challenges, but these various uh, inter internal parasites, um, they will require specific help from your diagnostician and, and specifically those at, at your vet diagnostic lab and you're in your, a good relationship with your veterinarian. Uh, so a little bit about the barber pole worm and why it's so effective at doing its job. As you can see in the image here, even with the lack of clarity, you can kind of see that barber pole pattern, that red and white uh, swirl there. Uh, that's where the common name barber pole worm comes from. Um, this, this species is predominantly our problem in irrigated systems and even in our humid temperate climates uh, internationally. Uh, one of the reasons it's so good at what it does is because it is a voracious uh, consumer of blood. Um, in a clinical parasitized um, situation, we'll see adult worms uh, anywhere from over 2,000 up to 6,000, what I've seen. But just take, for example, one adult worm consumes about 0 0.05 mils of blood per day. Uh, 5,000 worm, that's about a cup of blood per day. And so when we talk about anemia, obviously that is a direct result of that specific parasite. Uh, but we oftentimes see other losses that, that are harder to pinpoint um, unless we have some diagnostic tools to help us realize that we are dealing with an internal parasite issue. And largely, I want you to think about your flocks. And I know we all love spending time with our sheep. That's why we do what we do. But as we're out there observing, I think um, oftentimes we will see a single born lamb or even twin born lambs. Uh, we get to that 60 day mark where they really should be taken off and going wild in terms of their average daily gain and they just seem to be sluggish. They're not putting on the, the weight that they should. They're not, uh, ha don't have that shine to their fleece that perhaps you would notice, and they just don't look right. Um, oftentimes those, those, those not clinically ill sheep, but those subclinically ill sheep with parasitism uh, are just not performing the way they should, and therefore we are experiencing production losses. So it isn't always about uh, mortality and, and the, the fact that we're losing sheep with internal parasites, but it's the decreased production that I think leads us entirely. Again, many of you have seen this, and this is just a, a tease for next week, but uh, the FAMACHA scoring system is an anemia guide. It helps us identify those uh, on a scale of one to five that, that do require some anthelmintic or dewormer intervention. Um, the paler that membrane looks, the more closely it's correlated to uh, clinical parasitism with the barber pole worm. And so um, this does take some practice, but it's a very handy tool, especially as we think about making sure that we maintain a population of worms in our flock, uh, in sheep that aren't treated um, prophylactically or just across the flock. Uh, maintaining those organisms or those sheep that haven't seen a dewormer uh, 
uh, allows the populations of worms that, that thrive in our, our uh, farms uh, to still be susceptible to the dewormer. And that principle of refusia we'll talk about in more detail next week. But again, a very handy tool, a very good tool for the toolbox in terms of making a, a prescriptive uh, dose with a dewormer. Um, that, of course, with uh, fecal egg counts, I, I cannot uh, overemphasize the importance of, of also having that information to inform some of your management. Uh, again, just, just a quick overview. This is what we'll be talking a lot about next week. Now you ask yourself, how do you demonstrate that virtually? Again, that is a great question, but we have some, some ideas to how to do that. But really what I want to highlight with this slide is it's important to make sure that you utilize the card that's available. I know with anything in agriculture, the more comfortable we get, uh, we oftentimes may um, just rely on our, our, our own ability to conduct these, but I think it's really important that we continually use the card, keep it out of direct sunlight so it doesn't fade, and uh, it continues to be a useful tool if used effectively. There's other clinical signs of parasitism that, again, don't necessarily correlate to one specific species, but I know as good uh, stockmen and women out there that we take, take an eye to making sure that our sheep are in good condition. Um, you know, diarrhea is one of those that can be pretty subjective, and I don't always uh, use that as a, a, a conclusive diagnostic tool, but I think that in concert with um, poor body condition, uh, sluggish growth rates, uh, bottle jaw is, is a very um, pronounced clinical sign of, of internal parasitism with homonchus contortus, and, and that is almost getting to the point where it's hard to remediate some of those sheep without some specific interventions. But all of these, these aspects that we keep an eye on that we don't always necessarily pinpoint can help guide us in the direction that we're dealing with um, a barber pole worm infestation or other internal parasites on our operation. Um, some of these examples of barber pole worm I, I've stolen from international sites, but the reality is, is, this, is the, uh, this is a very, very far down the road clinical sign and, um, oftentimes our ability to intervene in a timely manner has already passed, uh, still require good um, animal health attention. But the reality is, is we want to be proactive in our management. A little bit more about the biology of the Moncus contortus. You know, these early stages uh, where that, that organism is um, an egg still in the fecal pellet, uh, an important component to remember is that um, lar the L3 larva um, they can't eat, they need to be ingested by a host or they will eventually die. So that, that image to the bottom there that shows those white worms in that dew droplet, uh, once they've hatched, um, they are very susceptible to um, being exhausted pretty easily. They travel up and down uh, many plant surfaces with the dew line and some of the atmospheric humidity. They are able to uh, survive with water. And that's one advantage that we have in our region where many of us uh, have irrigated acreage where we can turn off the water and turn it on, um, but also um, in some of our, our irrigation management techniques where we do allow a field to become pretty dry before uh, reapplying water to it, that may be a way to help minimize it. And that's a, uh, something that is going to require some more research in our, our region. How do we manage our irrigation techniques specific to our grazing of small ruminants? It's about seven days from the time that egg hatches to an L3 larva, okay? Once ingested, um, it takes roughly about three weeks for that L3 to become an adult that is reproductively active and also um, harvesting blood from the animal. Uh, something to keep in mind, and we often talk about this, and I'll show you some data here in a little bit from some folks in the Northern Plains, but we oftentimes assume that there's a carryover just in the fecal pellet in the pasture. And in our region where we have a tremendous um, range of temperatures experienced uh, in one day, and also the, the freezing and thawing and just lack of atmospheric humidity makes it really challenging for those to overwinter on pasture. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Um, I don't have a lot of evidence from the scientific literature in our region that the survival is a result of them overwintering in the fecal pellet, but there is a lot of evidence to suggest that these tissue dwelling adult worms are those that are allowed to carry over and kind of give us our perennial issues if we don't have effective um, treatment uh, protocols. Um, there are 200 female adults can produce about a million eggs in a day. Um, so they're very good at what they do. 
uh, especially in a continuous grazing system and high stocking rates, they're very good at making sure that they contaminate the pasture and they get ingested. Um, I mentioned this previously, and I'll show you a study on this next slide, but uh, L3 larvae don't do well during hard winters, and several freezing and thawing events will kill a large population of Thomonchus contortus eggs. Now, the exception to that may be that there's some areas of, of uh, well, where snow drifts in a pasture in your country where it, it kind of creates an insulative barrier. You know, that may be a situation where we may see the L3 larvae survive, but in our region, again, we just don't have a great... Uh, amount of data to tell us that uh, overwintering is occurring in the pasture. Um, this study out of, uh, I believe, South Dakota State University, um, you know, this is something that may conflict with a little bit of what we talk about a little bit later, not so much in that the study was not done correctly, but more so um, the other estimates of resistance in other parts of the country and how sheep are overwintering uh, may tell a different story. Um, from this study, they concluded, and again, it was in one flock, but uh, they concluded that overwintering of the barber pole worm was due to resistant tissue dwelling L4 larva, so those adult um, worms in the tract of the sheep itself. Uh, a, good, a good story that came out of this was that they still observed pretty good efficacy um, of the, the ingredients or the dewormers that we use that we're seeing widespread resistance to in other parts of the country. Now, I guess it's important to point out that, again, this was in one flock. Uh, but this study highlighted to me initially, as we thought about getting a better data set for our area in the Intermountain West, that it's just critical that you know what dewormer works on your operation. Uh, whether that be a fecal egg count reduction test with the help of your, um, of your practicing veterinarian or your diagnostic lab, whether that is a, a drench rite or a larval development assay where they actually send the feces, they hatch um, and develop to an L3 stage and they see how well different anthelmintics kill um, or prevent the development of those larvae. But the point is, is oftentimes we buy sheep, especially in our region, we buy sheep back in the east. And if you'll recall that map that I threw up earlier, very different climatic uh, patterns there and, and minimum temperatures that are pretty conducive to internal parasite development. So I'll mention this again, but it's really important that as we buy replacement stock, that we utilize a dewormer that is definitely going to clean up those sheep before they uh, go into our grazing system or a management system and contribute the genetics of those worms uh, to our flock. I think what is really helpful for me, especially, uh, I'm not a parasitologist, I should say that many times throughout this talk. I, I work with parasitologists, so that doesn't make me one, uh, but it's helpful for me as I, I work in nutrition quite a bit to understand the physiological challenges that happen as a result of uh, Haemonchus contortus infection. Um, this is a great diagram that uh, came out of HOST 2016, but it just shows what happens to the digestive system in the presence of Haemonchus contortus clinical infestation. You have changes in how those gastrointestinal hormones uh, or those, those hormones that control the pH uh, of various compartments of the digestive system, how negatively affected they are. We talked a lot about the constant immune response that those sheep are having to amount, and also replacing the proteins, the blood proteins that are lost to that, that worm. And so the, what the end result is, is we see a tremendous amount of inefficiency in terms of feed intake and conversion. Uh, you, they're basically destroying uh, the, uh, the architecture of the gut. Um, that abomasum, uh, that glandular stomach that going back to ruminant nutrition 101, um, that relies on a pretty low pH and good production of, of hydrochloric acid, right, to bust up all those bugs coming out of the rumen and supply good protein to the small intestine. If we raise that pH too much or disrupt the production of that HCL, uh, we really minimize the ability of that animal to thrive in the environment it was meant to thrive on, in grass. Also, the fact, if you want to conceptualize it this way, uh, you know, diet one is an example of requirements of an uninfected host, and diet, uh, the bar to the left, uh, shows the immune response required in the presence of a clinical parasitized animal. And so, even for ourselves, the cost to mount an immune response is not free. It takes 
uh, it takes some, some metabolic fuel, so to speak. And at the end of the day, that is what contributes a lot to the inefficiency in parasitized sheep. Now, I don't mention this earlier, but some really good work has come out of West Virginia, and, and there was some work internationally done too, is that if we are trying to help uh, an animal recover from um, this clinical parasitism that it's experiencing, bypass proteins, so soybean meals, um, basically extruded meals that have a higher degree of bypass protein that isn't being degraded in uh, the, the rumen that is absorbed primarily in the small intestine, uh, will help that animal regain some of the condition that is lost. Uh, I, I've seen mixed messages as we talk about remediating an animal that really experienced a, a very bad clinical infestation of barber pole worms. Uh, some, in, some evidence suggests that with time and, and good nutrition and making sure that that animal isn't reinfested, that you can help those animals recover. Um, but uh, in other cases, especially with lambs that are still growing, uh, I think the success rate is less, but I don't, can't speak to that definitively, not uh, having seen a lot of that data. But here's the story that really was the onus for us to get started thinking about what is the prevalence of resistance in our region? I throw three really great uh, studies that have been conducted uh, in um, mostly the mid-Atlantic and southeastern U.S. and then one from Ontario, Canada. And in the second column where it says anthelmintic class, that's the dewormers that we have available. And then that last column there looks at the prevalence of resistance. Um, it's important to keep in mind that, that drug resistance, uh, and I guess it depends on who you ask, but most of the uh, parasitologists that I've worked with, it, it's defined as when treatment fails to reduce fecal A counts by more than 95%. And, and that, that's an important distinguishing feature because um, you know, if we define drug resistance as killing the majority of the worms, we fail to account for the fact that those worms that are not killed um, are, are breeding with other uh, worms that are continually more resistant. And, and that's why uh, some, of, some more strategies to make sure that we can combat resistance in the short term are important. But a lot of this work came out of the southeastern U.S. and northern Canada. And so uh, it was we were wanting to understand what was the uh, true level of parasitism in our region. And so I'm gonna move into a little bit of the results that we observed from our study. Um, again, by no means is this exhaustive and does this not answer, this doesn't necessarily answer all the questions, um, but I think it gives us a decent baseline uh, to know in, in farm flocks or, or flocks operating on irrigated and sub-irrigated pasture that, that perhaps they need to take a closer look at what dewormers they use. These were some of the initial objectives, but the broad objective was just really to have a better um, data set to, to give good research-based uh, information to the, the flocks in our region. And so this was the primary question. Uh, we utilized um, a drench right larval development assay that I'll talk about in a second to determine or estimate resistance. Um, this picture right here actually comes from the western side of Montana, not too far from Kalispell. Um, this, I know you can't see through the trees, and I'm not trying to uh, be facetious here, but if you look past to the center right of that image, you'll kind of see a meadow there. And um, if you go even further, you'll see it's just a, a big drainage, actually, for the surrounding uh, wooded hills. And what I refer to as sub-irrigated is that those kind of meadows that, that have good access um, to percolation and groundwater so that um, they do maintain a wet soil surface most of the year. They're great at producing grass, but they're also good at producing parasites. Another scenario that I think we see a lot in the West, and this is a little bit fuzzy, but um, this is an example of some of these, these farm flocks that operate in these more productive valleys. Um, and this specific example, as you can see, is a sprinkler irrigated setup. Uh, not too uncommon for many of us listening in today, but those tuning in from further away. This is a very common method that we um, operate some of our smaller flocks in the Intermountain West. Uh, flood irrigation is another common area um, that we, we utilize in terms of irrigation management. Uh, our, our sampling happened, happened across two years. Um, again, I started this when I was wrapping up my time at Montana State University. My excellent collaborators, Dave Scott, Brent Rader, uh, Tom Murphy, helped uh, continue to help us sample some of these flocks and even one out of Utah. Uh, 
And at the time, really, we were just trying to target those flocks that uh, operate on irrigated acres. Um, as part of our data set, we did sample some range flocks just to give us a better idea of, of what they may be experiencing during the same summer months. And uh, we, we found pretty uh, definitively that, that our large rain flock, range flocks, especially operating in, in the mountains and larger grazing allotments, just don't experience uh, homonchus contortus infection like those on irrigated pastures do. I alluded to this earlier, but the drench right assay, we, we had to use this for our study simply because, as you can tell from the map, um, there is a lot of distance um, across those uh, sampling sites. And a fecal egg count reduction test requires that we, we uh, provide them, uh, well, two doses essentially, seven to 10 days apart, and that was, was not possible for us. So this larval development assay, um, we utilized through the University of Georgia, uh, Sue Howell and Ray Kaplan uh, were our very uh, excellent collaborators there. And this, this was developed in the 90s in Australia, 1990s in Australia, but uh, it allows us to test multiple drug classes um, in, in a one-stop shop. Now it is expensive and that's why uh, our excellent funding agency, Western SARE, uh, allowed us to, to offset these costs and defray these and, and allow producers to be, get a better idea of what they were experiencing on their places. So on to the results. Um, as suspected and as previously published, um, the major species of interest uh, was the barber pole worm at approximately 70% of all those ranches. So in this image you see here, the black bar indicates uh, what species, or I'm sorry, what, what the genus is for these specific uh, internal parasites. Homonchus predominated on a lot of those. Those other ones where you see um, also Trichostron gylus and Terlatter sasia, um, those are, are similar, um, but not the same genus. And so we observed a lot of these um, in, in flocks that um, necessarily didn't, didn't necessarily have a huge worm burden. And I'll show that in the next figure. This right here shows um, of those 11 ranches that we, I'm sorry, 12 ranches that we did the um, drench right on, we sampled a total of 25 across both years. And uh, many of those that were less than 500 eggs per gram um, in terms of uh, how many, what the total fecal egg count was, uh, a lot of those with lower fecal egg counts came from our range flocks. But as we went up in fecal egg counts, you can see that uh, those were predominated with Homonchus contortus. And so one other interesting finding that we found, again, understanding that the barber pole worm is the major culprit in all our issues, wasn't necessarily the most novel finding from this research. But again, it provided us across a larger, a semi-larger data set to be able to understand a little bit what was going on with the internal parasite species. But what really stood out to us and even our collaborators back east was how high some of these irrigated flood and sprinkler systems were in terms of uh, average fecal egg counts. Uh, over 2,600 eggs per gram on these irrigated operations versus 4,433 eggs per gram on the sub-irrigated operations. And that goes back to the, the biology of the barber pole worm. And essentially, in our irrigated systems in the West, we are creating a perfect environment for those, those uh, larvae to thrive. So what we observed from the results from this drench, right, were that 92% of the ranches uh, they were resistant to our benzimatazoles. Uh, so homonchus at these ranches, the majority of them uh, were not killed by uh, benzimatazoles. Ivamec again was a little bit more mixed results. Approximately 50% of the ranches um, were resistant to ivermectin. And our silver lining was that uh, boxidectin or the trade name cydectin, and I'm not promoting any product over the other, but this helps illustrate some of uh, the available products, as most of us don't work in the active ingredient uh, realm. Uh, 8.3 of the ranches, so basically one of the ranches that we sampled, um, only one of those moxidectin wasn't working. Unfortunately, we had some deterioration of the assay as it related to the levamisol, so that un is an unfortunate uh, hole in, in this project that we don't have a great estimate of um, how effective those products prohibit Levamed um, are for uh, controlling homonchus. Uh, 
And so some additional work is going to be required there. But I just want to, before I move on from this too much, again, if barber pole worm is an issue and you've determined that it's been an issue year on year, um, based on the survey results of our studies, our Valbazin was our, our most popular product. And that is a good product, especially for those ranches where homonchus is just not their, their major concern. Um, it's, it's excellent at, at controlling liver flukes and, and a broad spectrum of internal parasites. But, but if we operate on irrigated acres and we have a documented history of challenges with homonchus, um, I, I'd encourage you to work with your veterinarian, your extension agent, to determine whether it truly is working. There's some other management considerations that, that may go without saying, but I'm going to reiterate them anyway. Stocking density is a huge factor um, in um, how, how much internal parasites are ingested. Um, you know, the, there's mixed results, even in the literature, whether it's a, a rotational strategy or continuous um, grazing strategy where the sheep aren't rotated through various paddocks. Um, Stocking density we know is an issue, but I don't necessarily believe, especially in our region, that we have a, a uh, scientifically validated rotational strategy. We'll talk about some options next week, Thursday, with Dave Scott, who is a practitioner that has observed that uh, if he can keep rotations around 30 days, and he'll reiterate that, um, he has seen some success in limiting uh, re-ingestion of um, those L3 larvae. I already mentioned the effectiveness of the deworming program. Uh, it's important to remember that, that a small portion of the worm population has developed resistance, right? We talked about defining resistance as greater than, equal to or greater than 95% of those parasites being killed. But that remaining 5% is what is the genetic uh, basis for resistant worms. Uh, and I'll talk a lot about climate here in a minute, but in our region, what we observed from this study is that if we hit the road and started sampling flocks too early in June, when temperatures were still really low, that we did not see barber pole worm. Uh, when we got to July and August, those same flocks that we had previously sampled and saw nothing, um, the, the incidence of homonchus was, was significant. And it speaks to the importance of precipitation, or irrigation schedules and also temperatures. An excellent review paper uh, from O'Connor and Veterinary Parasitology uh, showed the range in some of these trichostrongulid species, okay, or what the temperature range is required for the egg to hatch and develop into an L3. And what was interesting to me as I looked at this and thought about our region, and you can even think about the weather data that you have on your individual operations, that um, we don't always have um, a lot of time in the summer where temperatures are, are, are above 50 degrees. And I'll show that in a minute, but this looks like a very broad range, but if you think about the elevation differences that we all experience, especially here in Wyoming, uh, and the effect that can play on, on uh, daily temperatures and daily minimal temperatures, uh, we don't, luckily, we don't live in a, an excellent environment for Hamacus contortus to thrive, uh, broadly speaking. And I show, I show this climate tool because I think this could be an excellent opportunity for us to really look uh, at climate data um, in areas and locations close to us. The, the website I posted at the top of this, but it is a really interactive interface uh, where you have various uh, locations that, that will be close to yours that you can use to look at historic data, uh, how much precip you usually see, wind speeds, minimum, maximum temperatures, all those things that affect how you operate. Because at the end of the day, we are reliant on Mother Nature and that dictates a lot of what we're able to do. But what I'd like to just point out with this revisiting it once again, is those areas in dark blue in the Intermountain West, and I'm looking at the western side of Wyoming, um, the northern panhandle of Idaho, um, the, the northeast point of Utah, those high elevations oftentimes experience temperatures that are not extremely favorable for uh, larval development. You can see in our area, and if you look really closely in the southeast uh, corner of Wyoming, uh, we, that is one of our better cropping sides of the state where we are able to grow some corn and have a little bit more row cropping. Um, some of what the, the ideal temperatures that would be experienced in that southeast corner uh, 
are very different than what we experience um, in the south, southwest corner of our state. And so the point being that uh, it's important to remember that um, as these, these worm burdens really explode and seem to just develop overnight, keeping an eye on those temperatures uh, where your nights steadily stay over 50 degrees would be good for your timeline to know when to intervene or know when to collect your fecal leg counts to send to your diagnostic lab, um, to do your Fomancha scoring, um, and also just, just to make sure that you are ahead of the game working with your veterinarian if necessary. Um, but really those temperatures over 50 degrees um, are when we would expect the barber pole worm to really take off. And for us in our region, again, as this, this highlighted figure shows, again, this, I just took an example of Uinta County. So again, that's in the southwest corner of our state. There is a good handful of farm flocks at that elevation in that part of the state. Um, their, their range for optimal conditions for Hamonchus contortus development really is restricted to mid-June to the end of August. Um, those various lines showed various predictions or where they should be, but on average, generally speaking, um, those daily minimum temperatures, uh, we don't experience six months of above 50 degree weather. And so that's one advantage we have um, when it comes to homonchus, but there's other species that are more apt to thrive in those cooler temperatures. And I'll just make brief mention of that later. Again, going back to some of the research that's been published, some excellent work um, from Joan Burke, Dave Notter, uh, the folks at the Katahdin um, and Louisiana uh, State University, they looked at some of these factors that affect fecal egg counts in Katahdin use, okay, shortly after lambing. What was interesting to me, and I think as we look at some of this research-based information, uh, even though it was conducted in Arkansas, I think there's enough similarities for us to, to be thinking about how we intervene uh, our management systems so that we can actually uh, make sure that we have an opportunity to stay ahead of this. What they observed is use had the greatest fecal egg counts about 28 days post lambing. Uh, that periparturian egg rise that we talk about a lot, I think a lot of that coincides uh, not only just from biologically within the U, some of those signals, but also just, just as temperatures increase as well. Um, they also observed that yearling use or younger use had higher fecal egg counts than adult use. And I think that makes sense. Those of us that, that do develop our own replacement ewes and ewe lambs. We understand that um, they require more in terms of nutrients than our mature ewes that have achieved their, their mature body weight. And um, that parasite burden on top of meeting their requirements for growth, you can imagine that uh, those in internal parasites have, a, have an easier time with those yearling ewes. Uh, lambs oftentimes 60 to 120 days. And I know that looks like a very broad range for many of you. But from this study, that's what they observed the greatest risk in those lambs. And also uh, going back to the ewes, not only those lambs from, from yearlings were susceptible, but also those lambs that were reared as multiples were at greatest risk. And again, thinking about those nutrient requirements for that, that twin carrying and twin raising ewe, uh, it, it makes sense that they would experience, their lambs would experience a greater challenge um, in terms of internal parasitism. So I want to make a point right now. I know this has been a little bit uh, all over the place, but I want to make sure that I'm clear that uh, those range operators that I work with versus irrigated and sub-irrigated have very different parasite challenges. Um, there's a much lower risk of internal parasites on our range flocks than there are from our irrigated, okay? Uh, again, a lot of that goes back to grazing density, the ability to ingest those stage three larvae. But I don't want to say that our range folks are out of the, the woods necessarily. They may be out of the woods with homonchus, but there's other uh, species that are at, are at risk. And this is where I really can't highlight enough the importance of not only using Fomancha testing, but in our larger flocks, I think it's really important to have a schedule that we collect fecal A counts from our flocks. Now, depending on your veterinary diagnostic lab or who you work with locally, uh, the cost may range, but here in Wyoming, uh, roughly $15 to $25 for a fecal egg count. Um, that can be a composite. That can also be uh, individuals of various ages in a larger flock. Uh, but the point is, is we're going to spend close to $100 on a 200 head flock. Uh, we could inform our management a lot more by determining 
what kind of species we have of internal parasites and also at what level do we have them. Uh, I will say that, you know, I'd never want to see parasites in our, our flocks, but I, I was hoping initially when I started that, oh man, maybe there's some range flocks out there that graze some sub-irrigated meadows at some point of the year that they're picking this up. And we don't have a robust data set yet. We're still compiling those with collaborators here in Wyoming. Uh, but, but what we've seen so far as a general trend is that our range flocks just don't have those challenges like our uh, intensively managed flocks. Something that you see across the literature, no matter what species it is, is the importance of fast and use. Uh, not necessarily 24 hours, but trying to fast them for some small period of time prior to administration of benzaminazole specifically. Um, for some reason, passage rate, uh, dilution effect, all those things as we drench those ewes, um, that fasting has been documented to, to increase efficacy. And so maybe that's bringing them in the corral a little bit early in the morning uh, and drenching them at noon. I, I'm assuming that uh, that 24 hours is the ideal as reported in some of these studies, but I think we might be able to see an improvement in the efficacy um, with fasting. I will share with you one small case study, and again, I haven't published this data because these things kind of occur um, here and there. But nematode iris is one of those species that um, doesn't necessarily show up in a large quantity in a, in a fecal flotation. Um, our northern latitudes have challenges with nematode iris, especially uh, lambs and yearling sheep. Um, these, these species require a much lower temperature um, for development. They actually require a, a bout of cold weather for them to be able to hatch. And there's work been done in the UK, some great work done in the UK to show that uh, as temperatures continue to rise in their area, that, that some of these organisms are becoming more resilient and they're hatching at warmer temperatures. Again, this is a, a species that uh, is more of a cold weather, early spring. Um, and one incidence we had this March and April uh, came from a large range flock actually um, that was having these issues in his replacement ewe lambs. So they'd be coming yearlings. And um, some of the work that I've seen corresponds with this, but they weren't necessarily on the highest plane of nutrition. It was a range flock. They were being supplemented. Um, they submitted a couple of, of uh, fecal samples to their, their local uh, diagnostician and um, for some reason it was overlooked and again a lot of this goes back to nematode iris they are highly pathogenic even in, in a, a low count and so um, this is the exception to what I previously talked about a cold loving uh, parasite species that causes problems at a very different time of the year and so I mentioned this just to state for those larger flocks or those range flocks that are listening and even our farm flocks that they have an annual calendar um, even prior to green up or prior to lambing that gives you an estimate of what kind of parasite uh, burden that you have. You want to be careful that you don't sample uh, too late in pregnancy. Obviously that hypobiosis or the, the periparturian egg rise we'll see after lambing could, could mess up the interpretation of those. But I think it's important to make sure that we incorporate these testing strategies into our flocks, no matter whether we're a range flock or more intensively a grazed farm flock. It all boils down to cost at the end of the day. Obviously, we're good stewards of the sheep that we take care of. We wanna make sure that we ensure, um, you know, the most ethical and um, careful treatment of these sheep. But at the end of the day, if sometimes we're so willing to, to drench our sheep, but we're so unwilling to really determine whether we need to. And that's the onus and, and some of the preemptive promoting of this week, next week's uh, FAMANCHA training. I think sampling uh, fecal aid counts, uh, making sure that we know what we have and at what quantity, and also making sure that we are selectively deworming our sheep can result in significant savings. Um, these are a lot of the products. I put this together with Dave Scott, oh, two years ago now. So these prices may have changed a little bit, but the point is, is across 200 ewes, um, we may be spending a large proportion of our animal health budget on internal um, dewormers unnecessarily. Or uh, we, we could save some money treating those that need it and not just mass treating everything. 
I'll give you one specific example is uh, we worked with one of these larger range flocks in our region to determine at various times of the year when they are working their sheep because they don't always have their sheep at close distance to, to drench them. Uh, to look at, at the fall and docking in the spring to kind of get an estimate of, of do we have parasite issues on some of these flocks. Um, and in this particular scenario, uh, we, we did this prior to them working the sheep and we were able to save quite a bit of doses at the cost of roughly about $9,000 a year. Uh, and I share that with all of you because again, especially as our input costs continue to go up, um, our labor costs continue to go up, it's important to understand that there is an economical benefit to us making sure that we're using dewormers judiciously. I have to thank all of the people involved in this study. Uh, never does anyone do good research. Uh, maybe 50 years ago, when we had all kinds of money at the state and federal level, uh, but anymore, it's a work of collaboration. And so all of these folks uh, that I mentioned here on this slide played a role in this. Um, even the consortium for helping us uh, with the grant application to make sure that we included relevant and accurate information. Hopefully that information has been accurate today. We also want to thank the producers, Montana, Wyoming, and also a lone producer in Utah that allowed us to sample their sheep and, and give them an estimate of, of what dewormers are still working on their place. And finally, again, another shameless uh, self-promotion for the FAMACHA training that we will do next week. Again, the registration will be different. I should point that out. At the lower right-hand corner there, you're going to have to register through ATRA, our, our colleagues at NCAT. And with that, I will take any questions. Melinda, I will try to get my screen back so I can see the chat box. I have struggled with that week in and week out. It's okay. So far, we don't have any questions in the chat box. So as those of you listening, if you have any questions, put them in there. I have a question, though, because I was doing some thinking on what you were talking about. And... I'm wondering what your recommendation is if you're having diff like multiple different parasite issues and you're seeing that something like valbazin is um, is got some some issues with whether or not it's going to work on some of the ones you talked about, but then that's the primary one that you would use on like liver flukes or something. So what is, what is your recommendation if people are dealing with more than one and there are certain ones that they have to use to hit those? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and that is a nuance to the resistant issues that we have. I guess the generic answer, Melinda, is to make sure that you do uh, have a good lab that you trust to, uh, to truly identify. Um, a copraculture will kind of It'll hatch some of those species so you can differentiate what you're dealing with. I know the, the assay required to look at look for liver flukes is, is quite different than what we deal with with some of our stomach worms. And so, uh, again, working with the lab to identify maybe it is liver flukes. And in that case, uh, valvazin is going to be a good op option for you. It may not be working on your moncus, but one thing we will talk about next week, Melinda, is combination drenches. Um, using two or three of these different active ingredient types of dewormers has shown really good efficacy. Now, I am not well versed enough to speak as to what those combinations should be or what they should look like, but I know uh, we will cover that to some extent tomorrow. Um, you know, that being said, I don't always, I'm not sure that we always have parasitologists in all of our veterinary diagnostic labs. That's one of the consequences of declining budgets is some of those really uh, rich expertise don't get refilled as positions. So I would encourage you to, uh, not only do you work with your veterinarian, but really work with a, a parasitologist that you have confidence in and you trust to help develop some of these strategies. How's that for a running around your answer? <laughs> I like it. So um, you guys have one, a parasitologist in your Wyoming State Vet Lab, correct? Yes, Dr. Barrett Bangor, she is an excellent parasitologist, uh, lots of experience in Cox City as well. That should be one of our, another topic that I could probably get her to speak about. But yeah, I, I think we are able to do a lot more internal parasite work now, not only with our collaborators in Georgia, but also uh, since I moved here to Wyoming, we have a really good resource in our vet lab. And so, you know, without getting in trouble with your other states, I know that that uh, if you go to the Wyoming State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab website, you could submit samples there. I know that they're very timely. 
and uh, the counsel that they give upon receipt of your results is really good as well. So that's a great resource for anyone who might want to get some really clear answers on their on their issues. So you do have a couple of questions coming in now. Um, the first one is, to, okay, so rotate to clean ground before seven days, correct? Wait how long before going back onto the same ground? Yeah, so I, I need to be careful with that. You know, that was prior to a lot of the ad advances we have now, um, that was kind of the strategy is you drench and then go to a clean pasture. Uh, what we understand now is that that is not always is effective, right? Because if you use a dewormer that doesn't work, they're not cleaned out and they go on that clean pasture and deposit all kinds of resistant eggs. So I guess, but if you're thinking about time frame, um, and again, I don't have great, great data on this, but some of the work out of Australia and some of the anecdotal re uh, regional stuff is it's about 30 days. I know that makes a lot, that makes a challenging grazing management system, but uh, seven days, I think, is still too soon to be rotating back on that. And I also think that your pasture, uh, what your forage type is in these irrigated pastures plays a difference. For example, Dave Scott, he'll talk about this next week. You know, the work we've done at his place, he has a, a very strong stand of meadow brome grass. And when that stuff gets tall, it lays down. Um, other, other operations, we have some people grazing some irrigated alfalfa stands. I don't think that's a dense enough canopy to really protect the stage three larva. In a meadow brome where it's, it's really thick and it kind of maintains a shaded, uh, humid kind of subsurface at the soil level, I think that's more um, conducive for it. So I would say longer than seven days, I think the recommendation under his grazing system, which is a heavy rotation, is closer to 30. Okay. Um, so Whit, I know you're not a goat person, but you have a question about whether or not the basic principles outlined today are going to be effective for goat producers as well. I think these general principles, uh, yes, there is a lot of overlap. We know homonchus is a major issue. The same species are an issue in goats as well. Um, there's some digestive physiology differences, slight differences with goats, uh, grazing preference. I think one major difference with sheep and goats and their grazing is that sheep always like to graze closer to that lush, very vegetative grass, even if it's right next to the ground. Okay, that's a perfect place for them to vacuum up those L3 larvae. I think goats being a little bit more browse oriented may be able to avoid some of that a little bit, but that's where I will deflect some of this back to going back to that uh, WormX website, that consortium website, because a lot of our collaborators back in the Southeast uh, do a tremendous amount of work with goats. So there might be some more specific uh, specifications for, for uh, goat grazing. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions that I'm seeing popping up. So thank you very much for sharing this. All of you guys watching, uh, make sure that you join us next week for a more in-depth conversation about this topic and to get yourselves trained up on that FAMACHA scoring. And um, so that'll be next week, same time, but different registration links. So you can find that on either of the Facebook pages and I will also send it out in the email on Monday. Um, and I guess that's all I've got for you. Please fill out the survey as you jump off. And thanks again, Wit. Yeah, thank you. If you have other questions, send me an email. If, if I don't have an answer, I'll send you to the people that do. Fantastic. Thanks guys. Have a good one.